In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. This is the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all again so much for being here with us today. We are so grateful that you are here. Again, my name is Desiree Tennyson, and I'm the Engagement Supervisor for Catholic Charities Fort Work. And I have the privilege of introducing our very own Marissa Kayan and Judith Priest, who will be our presenters for today. Now, like I said, I will be continuing to let people in. I apologize if there is, is now if, joining. If there are noises like that. <laughs> But please, for those of you who are on your computers and phones, feel free to utilize the chat box and introduce yourselves or utilize the raise your hand function if you are having any issues. But we'll be making sure that we are able to mitigate those issues if we can. So with that being said, I will have Miss Marissa and Judith come on in and introduce themselves and get us started with our presentation today. Hello, welcome. We're just so glad that you're here with us today. My name is Judith Alexander Priest. I'm the Director of Client Navigation uh, here at Catholic Charities Fort Worth and I oversee several programs. Um, they include our Beyond Belief, our coaching program, our Stay the Course program, um, now including our short-term case management program, which is new, which we'll be um, discussing today. Also, I've been overseeing our Stay the Course Replication program, um, and we are just delighted um, to have, oh, and also our employer-based services. I almost left that one off. Um, and we are delighted to have you all here today to share with you what we've been doing um, particularly since um, the COVID-19 pandemic crisis hit us and how we put this program together. And now I'll let Marissa introduce herself. Hi, um, so I'm Marissa Kylan and I'm the program manager of the short-term case management program. I've been working with Catholic Charities for about six years this September in various departments and programs, gosh, including advancement, research and evaluation, and data information systems. And I'm also very excited uh, to not only meet you virtually, um, but also to kind of share this program with you today. And so if I have Desi's permission to share my screen and get this started, do I? We are ready. Thank you awesome. so much, Marissa. Okay, so bear with me. I practice, but who knows what happens in the, you know, moment. Okay. Everyone able, or those that are on video, able to see the ending poverty is possible in Fort Worth. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So first, I just want to reiterate our thanks for attending our presentation today. Uh, I know this is in a traditional environment mm -hmm. of being in person, but I hope it's engaging and informative as if we were all together in one room. I also just want to give you a fair warning. I'm a big hand communicator and I'm unsure if it's gotten worse as a result of me being behind a computer screen versus in physical. So if my computer freezes and I have an absolutely ridiculous look on my face with my arms up, don't laugh so loudly that I hear it, but please enjoy. Um, my team enjoys taking screenshots when that happens. So. I'd really like to start by providing a timeline of the events that led to this program's implementation. I feel sometimes as if we've been working for from home for forever. 
Um, but I find it startling that back in January and February, we were in the office getting coffee in the morning and really just starting to hear more about the coronavirus or COVID-19 in China. Monday, March 16th is when CCFW began to work from home and we really started to experience that growing awareness of the impact to our economy, the clients we were currently serving, as well as individuals that we have not traditionally served in the past. Uh, we saw an early impact through our employee-based services or EBS program in which many of the clients being served in the hospitality industry were laid off or furloughed by the hotels in our neighborhood. Um, at one point, about 18% of the hospitality employees were working based on that drop in capacity. Let me see if I can. Hey, Marissa, give me one second. If everyone just keeps a reminder to mute yourselves, please, so we don't have any background noise. Thank you so much. There's a couple of new participants. If you can just mute your phone or computer, that'd be very helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so our intention and the purpose of this program is focused on serving as many clients as deeply as possible. The program was designed to be offered to as many individuals as possible and allowing them to opt out of services. We could estimate and assume the impact at that time back in March, but we also knew the program needed to be flexible and responsive to change as it occurred. Um, I think our dedication to serving our community started at home because we have staff members from other programs in the agency that chose to step into this program, myself included, to serve the growing need. We have four active navigators, two navigators from the EBS program, and two recruiters from our long-term case management programs transferred Marika over. Clarity. Hello. Is now joining. From the very beginning, the research and evaluation uh, department participated in program creation, as well as ongoing evaluation to support us in understanding the client need, as well as how the program can best serve them. So during March and during the SAS design period, as it very quickly became evident that we would be impacted, we turn kind of inward to understand how we can serve this new population based on our previous learnings and as existing programs. Our goal was to consider how the agency can best respond to the current crisis while at the same time solidify and prepare our program models for long term recovery that will be vital to our clients and in the community. Now, this program, like I mentioned, really kind of needs to remain nimble with the ability to scale up and down as the need arises. So unlike a point in time disaster, if we think about like her, one of the hurricanes or all the hurricanes, sorry, we expect that the current crisis will result in waves of is increase. now joining. Yeah, we expect that this current crisis will result in waves of increased or de decreased calls as kind of different industries are infected or are affected. So similarly to how we saw a very early kind of impact to the hospitality industry, we're now kind of experiencing from what we're hearing from these clients, kind of second and third rounds of impact. So therefore this program needed to be interlocking with both our community care, crisis financial aid services, and the long-term case management but not so interdependent that a gap is created when the program is no longer needed. So Michael Park. is now exiting. Oh, OK, well, we'll keep going. OK, so you guys are all, um, you know, supporters of Catholic Charities, and I know you, you have a lot of knowledge about us. So as you know, our services for these past years have really been growing strong for individuals who need long term holistic case management services such as Padua or Working Family Services, WFS. We also have a strong response for individuals who just need one time financial assistance, thinking community care. So from disaster management, we understand that it's not the very poorest among us who suffer the most in times of crisis, but those who were doing OK before the crisis. So these individuals who have never had to navigate the system of public benefits and often don't even know where to begin. So these people are unlikely to need services from our long term programs, but they could use more than financial aid. They need someone to help walk them through assessing emergency services that are being offered 
And providing this type of service will allow CCFW to lean into our strengths while helping as many uh, individuals out of crisis as possible. And so a lot with our um, intention and purpose for those not looking at the slide Rita is really, Shelton. really the factor that we're pivoting to serve is the now community, joining. especially those individuals that we haven't traditionally served, serving as many clients as possible. And most importantly, especially with our partnership with research and evaluation is maintaining a learning framework. In the same way that we could kind of estimate or think about what this program needed to be at the beginning, being able to adjust and see what is being represented to us in this moment of working with clients. Okay, so based on our experience with disaster response, we needed our foundational thought to be based on trauma-informed care. Kind of as I mentioned, in terms of disaster, in times of disaster, it's those that consider themselves secure or maintaining that might feel the deepest impact. Kind of as a result of this economic moment, trauma is not only created by COVID-19, but can also exacerbate existing or underlying issues that may uh, be occurring. So Tara Bratch defines trauma as when we have encountered an out of control, frightening experience that is, has disconnected us from all sense of resourcefulness or safety or coping or love. And I think we can all potentially say that with this situation, whether medical or safety, financial, there's been this kind of frightening awareness. Um, so the trained navigators engaged are engaging with clients under the assumption that all behavior has purpose and meaning, and it's a response to the trauma experienced by the loss of financial security. So the initial assessment interview, which we'll talk about that a little bit later as we talk about tools, is conducted by this trauma-informed navigator. Often individuals who call in kind of have that tunnel vision on their immediate need, where we'd like a trained social worker who can help them identify needs that we can support within our program. And just, you know, a huge thank yous. Judith has been an incredible educator and advisor for the short-term case management program as it concerns serving in that mindset. Um, we've seen a variety of actions to the reactions to the situation with our client. And we realize that trauma can manifest in a multitude of ways for the clients. So in one such case, the couple were entrepreneurs who worked together and had just brought home a brand new baby. The economic impact on the new parents kind of just froze them from action. Um, it, you know, they had bills piling up, just got back from the hospital. Thankfully, they con con ooh, excuse me, contacted CCFW. And during that first conversation, the navigator allowed a variety of emotions to be felt by the client, including anger, worry, and fear for the future. The navigator took detailed notes related to their largest needs of housing, utilities, and baby supplies for their brand new addition. Uh, the next step was helping to understand the resources available and communicating the relationship the nav navigator provides as well as how we can help. So we access baby formula and diapers from the donation center. So thank you anybody who has um, dropped those off. We provided donated gift cards to Walgreens for any other needs to fill in that gap. The navigator then sent the applications for the Community Action Partners Housing Assistance Fund. She also called the landlord, negotiated down the late fees and the rent due for that month while providing financial assistance towards their utilities. And I believe the actions of the navigator is based on understanding and acknowledging the manifestations of trauma and responding to that need. And that's that's really you why I kind of put this document. I don't document. know how long this thing's going to be. Um, this is why I kind of put up this document was, you know, we're, we're trying to be able to realize the widespread impact of the trauma to recognize the symptoms in that. However, they're going to express or manifest in our conversations how to respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into our procedures and our practices. And then, of course, do what we can to resist re-traumatization um, of these clients that we're serving. OK, great. So. And um, I wanted to kind of discuss eligibility and the process for enrollment into the program. So the program is supposed to receive referrals from internal long term long term case management programs and community care. So kind of on that. Oh, that's right. I have a pointer. So when we're talking about our long term destabilized CCFW clients, a great example of that is going to be our EBS program. 
We're on the kind of other end. We're going to be receiving these inbound calls uh, to the community care staff and volunteers. I will come back to this. The client, if they meet the workforce criteria, which is our eligibility, they will go to a short term case man, a uh, short term navigator um, where there's kind of two ways that we are serving them. So one is financial assistance only, where our services are not needed or desired by the client, but they're gonna receive that requested financial assistance and we're gonna close that case. And of course, when we close a case, they are always welcome to reach back out to us. The kind of other avenue is what we consider our service delivery of case management services, where services needs are identified and desired by the client, and they're also receiving that requested FA and kind of a service plan is created and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so really so far where we are, we'll talk about that, but 39 of the cases were from destabilized clients from the EBS program, which means close to 200 referrals so far have been from um, community care as inbound calls to the agency seeking assistance. And so I'd like to take a quick moment on that workforce criteria. So what we mean by that and that eligibility is the client is not on long term disability and the client is currently in the workforce, was recently in the workforce and plans on returning to the workforce. OK, so um, like we said, the program is intended to serve clients that are not on the long term disability, but plan to kind of return to that workforce. And so I know we have question and answer time towards the end. We can come back to this, but I would like to say that if you know of any individuals that are eligible or potential candidates, I encourage you to share a community care number. So. OK, so kind of what are the components of short term case management? It's very similar to the work we've been doing in long term case management but through the lens of a shorter term commitment. So as always with our services, they're client led. We're going to be meeting with the clients through video chats or phone calls. We'll still use the same client led approach that defines our case management work. And keep in mind that these clients may differ from clients you've worked with before. Uh, they may be experiencing a crisis for the first time in their lives, uh, and they may never have needed to navigate those benefits or financial assistance. We also believe in holistically serving them. And so clients may have an immediate financial concern to address, but we're here to addre help address those needs. We'll also help them assess other challenges that may be barriers to their well being. Uh, short term case management is designed to last from a single visit to as long as three months. Um, and, and we're seeing a little bit more of that too, but like we mentioned, and kind of it's this theme is we're learning as we go. And especially not only with our clients, but I think we as individuals are learning and experiencing how the economy and our lives have been kind of changed as a result of coronavirus. So um, we want to be strategic as possible. So we're here to help those clients address immediate financial concerns and help them determine where they want to go and what they need to do to get there. And then, of course, that support we're asking, you know, we are asking these clients to potentially navigate an uncharted path and we want to be able to provide that support and training necessary to do that job. Um, and, you know, in terms of kind of contact and everything else, I would say within that first week, we have multiple contacts with the client because the majority of the time is we're doing what we can to get that financial assistance taken care of that that immediate financial concerns. So getting the paperwork or potentially communicating with a landlord on removing late fees, um, something along the, those kind of ways or communicating resources. And then what we're seeing is kind of a little bit of like a, a, a weekly check in, um, maybe bi weekly. And, you know, it's either the navigator reaching out to the client or the client is following up with the navigator. Um, I, I absolutely adore is one of my navigators communicated that she received um kind of one of her first clients as she came in and he was he just he got that paperwork to her he was ready to go and he got to the point where he was just checking in daily and he's like miss andrea is there anything else i can do is there anything else i can get done and she'd be like no we're good we're you know on hold what's going on and and you know to be able to facilitate that conversation with him um so i i just think that's a great moment of support to be able to see how these 
you know, the client and the navigator can work together to kind of stabilize and support and encourage along the way. So kind of in considering potential interactions and, you know, what is the economy going to do and who might we see, we kept, we started asking ourselves, like, what client might we see that maybe we haven't seen before? And so we kind of thought about this in tier one, and this was way back in March, and this actually has uh, proven true uh, for some of our clients as they've kind of fallen into one of these three tiers. So tier one um, are what we consider clients who come from a place of stability, but perhaps both parents have lost their jobs and are needing help navigating the process of getting benefits. And so the way that I think about these clients are ones that really show it have like show initiative. Um, so, for example, is, you know, we'll we'll have a client come in and, and this has happened and he says, no, I just need help paying this month's rent. Um, I've already applied for a new job. I um, I start in a week and a half and I just uh, need a little help getting into this month and then I'll be fine for next month. And, you know, we we do our assessment, we check in, we all be obviously offer our services if they need any more, but they kind of had that plan in place. They were impacted. They showed that initiative. They had taken care of either applying for unemployment on their own, SNAP, TANF benefits, um, and kind of what we can just consider is like filling in that gap, you know, to get them to that next that 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 next step, that process. With tier two, um, those are the clients who are experiencing the trauma um, and potentially need more supportive services. And so, for example, is, you know, um, I use the example um, of those parents as well in terms of they just had a whole lot happen to them kind of in one moment and just kind of walk to us in terms of that um, that trauma. Um, and so what we've really worked on is not only helping take care of that primary financial, but realizing and working with them on those other services that are needed. So whether that's applying for unemployment services or, or TANA for SNAP as available or accessing food banks to be able to kind of reallocate their money. And then tier three, some of us should be pretty familiar with this one, but they're clients who have had substantial needs before the crisis hit. They have multifaceted needs and may be good candidates for long term case management. And so, um, you know, we should be very familiar with a lot, uh, you know, with these clients that have sometimes come into our long term case management and they're still here. You know, it's not just this new population that we're serving uh, that's been affected, but we're continuing to serve the clients that we have been. And so, an example that I have of, uh, um, of this one, and I, I'm so excited how this worked out. Um, but she um, she was a single mom, and um, she is expecting, and then has two more children, and she was living in kind of unstable housing. Um, and so what we did is that real that first financial need is we stabilized their housing, and then almost immediately she communicated that she wants that that income, she wants that kind of better um life for her and her kids she wanted to have an apartment um and so we connected her to our career and vocational services program and guys within two days um she had a job interview and within four days she um she was um able to start her job and you know that allowed her very quickly to be able to stabilize her own housing and we continued to supplement for example gift cards uh, or gas cards to get her to work or um, one of the, uh, we had a Olive Garden gift card donated and you know after getting the new job and and really being able to celebrate that success that was such a cool gift card to be able to provide to this client to be able to take her chil two children out um, to Olive Garden to be able to celebrate well not out to Olive Garden but they did the pick up and the you know go back uh, new environment. Um, and so, you know, and that's somebody that, one, she's interested in that long-term case management. So what we've been really working with in the short-term case management is that kind of stabilization. Um, and then what we'd like to do is really, because she's she's talking about that that change language, that she wants something better, that she, you know, she she's reached and she's that bigger, brighter future kind of thought, you know, and we we want to help her 
uh, you know, transition out of this program into long term. And so she can she can work towards that future. So. OK, so kind of who have we seen so far? Um, so like I said, we have those four navigators. Our goal is a caseload of 35 to 40 clients. So far, we have served 203 clients in short term case management since April 6 when we started bringing into this program. And so. I kind of want to talk uh, and then two is just just a little data and I'll read it out for those that are on their phone. Um, but in terms of who have we seen at gender, it really has been um, a big focus on actually male clients. Um, so 75 percent um, and 25 percent female. What we've also seen is race and ethnicity that we've seen 45 percent of our clients are African American. 14% uh, are white or Caucasian. Sorry, that was hard to read. 14%, I'm so sorry, is that kind of unknown. And then 20% is our Hispanic or Latino with also um, um, one or two or Asian Pacific and Hawaiian um, displayed in there. Oh, sorry. Okay, in terms of age, um, so our three kind of biggest populations is, um, 29% have been between the ages of 26 to 35, 26% 36 to 45, and then 22% that 46 to 55 age range. And we're going to talk about it, but we do an initial um, kind of assessment. And one of those questions is, are you employed upon enrollment in the program? So at this moment that I am talking to you and having this initial, are you employed? And when they're coming to us, 91% are saying that they are not employed at this moment. For those that are saying yes, you could potentially have seen a decline in hours or potentially one of the partners in the household has lost their job. So we might have been talking to the main client uh, that called in, but their household may have been affected um, by that. But let's go on to the next. OK, so. When we talk about not only service beyond that client led and holistic, we kind of have three three components that we really focus on on how we're serving clients. One of that is financial assistance. We have what we consider resource navigation and then resource connection. And so financial assistance, hopefully it can kind of speak for itself, but that's providing that immediate financial assistance need. And we'll talk a little bit about the focus areas of what we're seeing there. But when we're talking about resource navigation and resource connection, it kind of uh, is more focused on the role the navigator takes and how we're serving them. So when we're talking about resource connection, that's going to be an opportunity where they communicate that they they need access to uh, a food. And so that's us going, OK, let me pull up the food banks, uh, the list of food banks or where they're providing services, and I'm going to, you know, geospace around your area and then send that information over when it's open, um, what days it's open and what you can obtain there. So that that's kind of that resource connection that that little touch. When we talk about resource navigation, this one really came out of the idea of the new clients we were going to see. So those that are not familiar with um, applying for uh, applying for unemployment or applying for SNAP or applying for food stamps. Um, and so that they just might need a little extra help. So that that can be a variety of things that can be sending them kind of tips and tricks or, you know, really helping them go. OK, these are the documentations that we're going to need. And I, I imagine you guys uh, potentially heard at the very beginning is no one could get through to be able to apply for unemployment. So definitely giving them suggestions about I know it's late. But we hear that between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. is a really good time to get in. But we've also had the circumstances where we have sat on the phone with our clients and we've just supported them through this process that they just they need to be able to read out every question and get reassurance that they're answering that question correctly. And we've done that with our clients. Um, if that's the way that we can support them, 
then that's that's the way that we will we will support them and uh, especially in this environment um, where they're they're unfamiliar with this and so those kind of the th really three tiers that this all comes through and we'll talk a little bit in terms of like what connections we are making or how we're navigating um, and to where are we navigating clients so on top of that you know what tools are in our kind of tool belt um, under those kind of three, um, what is it? Oh, I'm so sorry, three tiers. But one is financial coaching. And so when we mean financial coaching is we have this opportunity where the clients call in to us and they're saying, this is my immediate need and financially. And we're like, okay, but we also want to articulate and talk about what are your other needs that are going on? And so we try to get really creative. So we use a tool or we use a, a schedule to be able like, when when are your bills needed and how, how much is coming into this household? And therefore we can potentially na navigate. So for example, uh, we've had a client that is making just under $10 um, a, a week or sorry, month to be able to pay her rent. And so that's a conversation for us to be able to be like, sorry, it was a week now that my memory serves, but how can we help her fill in that gap and allow her to kind of save up the extra money? And so if she has money going out to be able to pay somebody to take her to work, then we're gonna help supplement with a gas card. Or if she has money going out for groceries, how can we supplement with other external resources, including food banks, um, or, or donated gift cards that are available to that individual. Um, but that's that's really kind of, we, we really wanna figure out, and what we're gonna talk about too with financial coaching is thinking beyond a little bit of that, that first financial assistance. So what is next month gonna look like? I think we've got our plan for next month, or, or this month, we've taken care of June. What What is the game plan for July? We've got these, these bills coming up, how are we going to meet these? How are we going to, you know, help with income? How are we going to help with financial assistance or external resources in order to meet next month's need? So that's kind of financial coaching. Um, when we talk about the initial assessment, it is something that we do with everybody uh, that we have that first kind of conversation. A lot of it is just very natural in terms of understanding who's in the household, have they been affected by COVID, how have they been affected by COVID, but it provides us an opportunity to really see what are their presenting needs and kind of what are their secondary needs. And that's an opportunity where we really just have a conversation with clients um and we we let them tell us their story and then kind of at that point we can be really strategic and say i think this is something that you communicated i believe you know this is a referral that we can do or a resource that we can provide you um also and i might as well just pull sorry i had photos um but when i was talking about with financial coaching it's this idea of this you know visually understanding what's due what's coming in um and and kind of how does that help um and then when we talk so we have the initial assessment and then what we have is the matrix and so the matrix is a 10 domains with five outcomes so i i hit the wrong thing so i just have two of the 10 right here otherwise it would just take up the whole page but um what we have is not only do we do this initial assessment, but we use this matrix to understand where they are in these 10 domains with real physical you know, outcomes. So for job and employment has no job all the way up until five, which is maintains permanent employment with adequate income and benefits or income has the no income versus income is sufficient, well managed and allows for discretionary spending. And so really what we're seeing in terms of the matrix is it being focused within that one to two um, kind of outcome column. And what we're trying to do is work with those clients to try to get up to kind of stable. That's what really is kind of that goal. Um, so they'll have that source of income, they're employed full time um, or has income to meet those basic needs, whether that's unemployment coming in for the time that they've been laid off. Um, but we use that to really identify how we can help them and um, what resources that we have available. 
Um, and then I, I want to talk about too is internal referrals and external referrals. So we're very fortunate here in Catholic Charities to be have two very supportive programs. One is uh, we call them support uh, specialists where they are focused on helping us with you know, kind of unique situations, or if we need a little bit more capacity, they're able to help us with that. So whether it's created transportation options or a child care connection, those are really where we kind of get, which usually lends itself to external referrals. Thankfully, they're there to, to help our capacity and kind of target down on what our need is. Um, but not only that for internal is we have our career and vocational services program, which is done an incredible job like related to the client we talked about that got employed within four days they're working very hard to update the resumes of our clients connect them to jobs uh, that hopefully fit their experience or what they're needing financially to be able to support their family but they're working very hard and that really allows us to move up on this um, matrix from potentially they come to in uh, to us in crisis with no job and no income and either you know through help with resource navigation through unemployment or working with CVS we are able to move them up to stable if not maybe a little bit higher because it would be great if they you know had those benefits as well um so that's that's kind of how we work with our internal and then of course our external referrals is we can't do anything and so externally the options and the connections that are available available to us so of course child care opportunities are there food stamps you know the donation center we're working currently or trying to work currently about you know putting furniture in somebody's home um we you know which is arlington mission and so on and so forth so those kind of external resources and um and referrals that we have are fantastic especially i would say is we're automatically pretty much navigating everybody to apply for cap or fort worth cares benefits um which is your community action partners um to be able to serve those needs as a community and kind of fill in those gaps last but not least is referrals to long-term case management so especially for those clients that kind of have what we consider that kind of like pre-covid crisis we definitely want to get them to a stable position and you know let them kind of realize or have the ability to see the benefit of long term case management uh, that they can be provided um, during that. And so we are making referrals. Um, so just kind of as a, a little bit of summary, this might be a couple of days late, um, but so far we've referred 25 clients to our CBS services and many clients are seeing very fast employment. We've also referred 12 clients to recruitment for long term case management. Uh, and six of those clients have successfully at this time enrolled into Padua services. Um, we are seeing most of the entrance towards long term case management come from those that were struggling pre COVID or potentially were in the EBS program because they previously see the benefit of this long term case management. So. So kind of what have we learned? And I'm so sorry, I'm right at it. I'll be done in five minutes, Desi, my bad. Um, but kind no, of no, what, no. thank you. OK, so average days served in the program so far has been about twenty two point two five days. Um, but like I said, we started serving clients um, April 6th and we're still receiving clients on a weekly basis. So that that's always going to be a bit of a kind of moving number. And I don't think we're going to have the full picture until the end. Um, what we've seen kind of our top three presenting needs. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, potentially financial assistance is housing rent and mortgage so out of the financial assistance that we have provided 63 of 63 percent of that has gone towards housing which is rent and mortgage payments secondary to that is utilities water and electric at 22 percent and then transportation gas and kind of loan payments has really been 3% and if you think about it like at 3% that is a very small but that's meaning that your top three needs or presenting needs for this program is I believe I did the math and it's 80 something I think yeah um, 80, 80 88 I think percent of um, our financial assistance is going to top three resources provided so far in the program has been that financial assistance which shouldn't i mean that's our number one what we're doing when they first come in is to help with those presenting needs um employment assistance so whether connecting them to cvs helping them apply for unemployment benefits bringing in that income 
And then food resources. So a lot of what we're hearing is as a result of a lower income is needing those resources. So like I said, our biggest financial needs have been related to housing and utilities. The program has a the program has an $800 current cap, which is used creatively with clients to meet their needs but it's not always met. So for example, we can have a client that has become stabilized with only a $150 gift card for some food and $70 towards a replacement refrigerator because his refrigerator had broken and he was you know, putting ice daily into a cooler to be able to keep his food. Um, and he was applying for jobs. He was very creative and resourceful and, and that's what it needed to, to um, stabilize. Um, we also see those that come in needing rental assistance and eight hundred dollars will not meet it all so that's where we really budget and we prioritize their needs on how to fill in the gap whether it's with food stamps to save the extra for rent or asking for assistance from family we've also find ourselves in negotiating with landlords to either create a payment plan or removal of late fees um, we automatically refer everyone in tarrant county to community action partners and now fort worth cares and housing is our biggest concern in this program, not only related to timing with evictions, but the limited FA to be able to meet the need, not only with our resources, but as a community. So kind of my, in, if you want it, but my insight uh, would that be that uh, would be that clients do not feel like they would be impacted for as long as they have. We've had clients call back in April and felt stabilized with FA and resources paid for May and a you know, but follow up three weeks later and request more FA for next month's rent. The navigators were wisely more cautious. I give it up for them um, for not kind of taking the client's word at the stability because we did not see a source of income, whether it was unemployment or a new job. Uh, we've really tried not to close out until we see a source of income for the next month. Um, that's a, kind of a big thing for us, um, but many clients who were furloughed felt like they would only be off a month or so and have been disappointed to be told by their employer that they should apply for other jobs. And that's a really hard conversation to have with those clients. Um, just really kind of like the other kind of insight from the team and stuff is this continuous need and awareness. Um, you know, not really necessarily knowing when this might end um, or when potentially we'll we'll see. You know, Michael I'm still is I'm now still exiting. receiving I'm still receiving receiving for referrals that are saying lost job versus COVID. And I've also, you know, it's kind of like a a, a series of streams where it's like, you know, the first, the hospitality industry really being one of those key indicators. Where now we're seeing second and third tier um, impacts to the economy and jobs. And so really uh, just to kind of close this out um, and next steps is the program is kind of running until the need is met that that is our intention and our purpose to be able to serve that kind of new population fill in that gap and then really kind of explore the linkage between short term and long term case management and and how that that gap you know that existence can be served and filled and learn what our clients are needing from us during this period of time and how can we continue to make that available to um, people who need it in the future um, but otherwise I I think I've run over my time, um, but I've also come to the end of my PowerPoint, except for the QA. Hold on. I'm going to do it for you. There we go. But anyways, okay. Desi, it's yours again. I'm actually going to take it from here, Marissa. Oh, there we go. So thank you all so much for being here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joanna Brewington, and I have the honor of serving as the manager of the major gifts team at Catholic Charities. And I am going to facilitate some of the questions that we've received today. So Marissa, one of the questions that we've been asked is, can a client call by themselves or do they need to be referred by some other agency or organization? No, they can call by themselves. So communicate, uh, community care is available and accepting phone calls to really have those conversations between um, eight and 12, Monday through Friday. So please encourage them, share that number, share that time for them to, to reach out. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I just put that in the chat box. Thank you. And then I received a couple of other questions. Um, how do we leverage community resources when there are so many people in need right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, you know, and Judith can jump in at any point too, but I think it's a realization that 
the need potentially is out growing the resources but that's really what we're trying to do is so for example one of our support specialists who's been doing an incredible job has been keeping uh, a live kind of website sharepoint for us with all these resources so she's always updating to be able to do that um, but there are many people in our organization that are creatively working with other external resources to be able to um, you know create a helpful relationship um, one of those is child care associates um, are making available child needs, which we have benefited from diapers and so on and Murphy, so forth. Murphy Markham is yeah. now exiting. Yeah, Judith, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say that for us, it's really important for all of our teams that we um, do warm handoffs. We like to have relationships with the people that we're referring to. Um, that they know us and we know them. Um, so we're not just giving our clients a name and a phone number to call, but sometimes we're making that initial call on their behalf or we're making that introduction by phone with them or you know, um, via email. Uh, we want it to be as personalized as possible, but there are so many great organizations in our community and together we can accomplish so much more than we can just individually. Great, thank you. Uh, another question is what kind of ongoing training do the case managers receive to help with evolving situations? Yeah, so um, I can really point to one of the you know key ones is the fact is, is making the team itself and Judith and Jennifer with research and evaluation, not only making ourselves available to be able to what we consider staff or talk about that client experience um, and what's kind of happening and what are their next steps. So I think of it as almost kind of a mentoring opportunity to be able to do that. But in the same way that uh, resources are connected through the support specialist, that's also made available. Catholic Charities lately has been doing a really great job about doing our internal trainings as well that might be beneficial, that they are always welcome to. And I would say Judith is the queen of sharing external opportunities with the team, where we then do a conversation of, okay, who wants to go and take notes for everybody and then present it back, you know, or they have the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you and know. I would just I would just add to that um, what Marissa was talking about. Once a week we do a case staffing with our team um, so that when they have cases that are just extra challenging or they're stumped, uh, we can share ideas uh, with one another also to celebrate the successes that we've had, things that we've learned uh, in working with a client so um, the other team members can gain that information and, and knowledge. Um, and as Marissa said, we do a lot of training for our teams at Catholic Charities on everything from um, trauma-informed care to solution-focused uh, um, initiatives and interventions um, to you know strong communication and um, negotiation skills yeah. when we're talking about working with uh, some of the utility companies and landlords etc we we have them all the time great thank you so could you all tell us if short-term case management is one of the programs that's really utilizing say our transportation program um, things like that for clients who who maybe have a job but have lost their form of transportation yeah so that's one of the the circumstances that we we work with um, alicia who's the transportation specialist now i would say with this a kind of new group of clients, we haven't seen a whole lot that are without vehicles. The majority have, or it's been a real big priority for them uh, to keep those vehicles, which is why the third highest is like car loans and gas, is because they see how valuable that is to being able to get that income. Um, but in the circumstances uh, that we would need those kind of resources, that's really where we creatively work with Alicia and support specialists as the transportation support specialist to identify public oper you know, public transportation opportunities within their area. You know, do we we help with the gas or potentially Uber to get things through? And that's just one of the cards in the deck to be able to. But I, I would communicate that 
I, we have not experienced that a whole lot so far in short term case management. Most people have, uh, have remained access to their car or public transportation. OK, great. Thank you so much, Marissa. Mm -hmm. If anybody has any other questions, you can certainly raise your hand, as Desiree explained earlier, or put a chat in the chat room. We'd love to be able to answer any and all questions that you might have. No, okay. Well then, I we are going to give everybody the happy gift of time today. Um, I really do want to, oh, Steve oh. and Sharon raise their hand. Steve, if you will unmute, if you'd like to speak and ask your question. Can you unmute your call, Steve? It's a microphone on the little bar that goes across. Okay. You may have, was that you? <laughs> Okay, Steve, either Alma or I will call you after this presentation. Oh, was that you? No? Okay. Um, after this presentation, and we will answer whatever question you might have. Um, again, I want to remind you all in true Catholic Charities fashion that your Catholic Charities person will be calling you today um, because we really want your feed your feedback. And uh, we always want to know what you think we are doing right and what you think we